Okay, thank you so much everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Saad Qasim and on behalf of the International State Crime Initiative, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our inaugural uh, lecture today. Uh, we are very lucky to have Greg Constantine with us, uh, who will be talking to us on issues at the intersection of statelessness, identity, citizenship, and human rights, as well as uh, the use of the still image in state crime research. Uh, Greg's award-winning photojournalism fuses a unique blend of creativity, compassion, and deep determination to bring to the forefront some of the most, the most underrepresented questions of our time. Over the past 10 years, Greg has visited over 12 countries and harnessed the power of the lens to document the plight of those who have been denied the most fundamental of rights. In addition to his recent collaboration with ISKI as a visiting distinguished scholar and a week-long exhibit showcasing Myanmar's Rohingya, Greg has displayed an amazing capacity to work with various international organizations, civil society, and educational institutes to really raise the plight of the state of stateless people across the world. His award-winning photojournalistic work has been featured in numerous uh, platforms and websites and, and uh, publications, including the New York Times, The Economist, CNN, um, and uh, Forced Migration Review. And he has collaborated with a wide spectrum of leading international human rights uh, organizations, including MSN, MSF, UNHCR, um, and Refugees International. His third book, Nowhere People, has recently been, been published. Please join me in welcoming Greg Constantine. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. I'm, you know, my book bad I had in the way. But uh, thank you very much. I'm really, you know, incredibly honored to be here at the university for the time that I'm here. Um, so, it's so rewarding to be able to collaborate with the International State Crime Initiative, particularly in the timing of the release of their, I mean, really what is a groundbreaking report, I think. Um, and also to try to, to be here to kind of add what I, the work that I do and what a lot of other documentary photographers do into the conversation that people are having about um, human rights issues, state, particularly state crime issues, um, and what, can, what photography can actually contribute to that kind of conversation that's taking place. To give you a little bit of history about myself, um, I'm from the United States. Um, I became, I made a big shift in my career about 13 years ago. Um, I've been a full-time documentary photographer now, and I, I'm based in Bangkok, um, Thailand. Um, I moved from the United States to Bangkok to specifically work on this particular project, Nowhere People, which basically documents the impact that the denial of citizenship and statelessness have on ethnic communities around the world. Um, if any, my interest in the subject has grown considerably. It's a 10-year project that's now kind of coming to a close, but um, my interest in the subject kind of touches on any number of different things, one from just the obvious of the histories behind some of these people, the invisibility of their kind of their condition, but also in how this particular project and the issue of statelessness touches on so many much larger themes that I think are so relevant to the way in which we live today, like the, the power of the state, the arbitrariness of the state, the connection, the intersection between human rights, um, human rights law and the state, um, identity, uh, democratic processes, the list could go on and on and on. What I'm going to touch on today and talk about will be just a small slice of that much larger 10-year project. Um, during those 10 years, I, my initial intention was to uh, create a photo essay about stateless people in Asia, and that grew over the 10 years to then ex include the Middle East, Africa, Europe, Dominican Republic, um, and everything. And the, the, this book that's just been published, it kind of touches on 12 situations of statelessness around the world. What I'm going to touch on dovetails and syncs up specifically with the State Crime Initiative report that has to do with the, the situation for the Rohingya and Burma. Um, and I'll quickly uh, kind of give a little bit of context to the, 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 
the situation for the Rohingya, and then I'll go into talking about my, my images, the methodology behind wh wh how, why I chose to photograph certain things, why, th why my work has been edited in a certain way, and why my focus has been particularly on this community. And then I'll kind of end the whole presentation a bit on how my work um, in photography can as a collaborative effort I, effort, I think can, can drive the conversation even further for some of these big things like the State Crime Initiative is doing and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, I started my work on the Rohingya community would have been in early 2006. Um, really nobody was paying any attention to the story then. There's a long history of persecution to this community that goes back into the 1940s even beyond but particularly from 1960 on. What, some, what most people have to understand about the situation of statelessness is that really, and particularly the Rohingya community, is that what's happened is that for decades, the Burmese authority has imposed all of these invisible kind of administrative tactics onto this community that hasn't really translated into what I think most people would consider to be enough to pay attention to it, and that would be killings, violence, a phys it hasn't manifested itself into some kind of physical form. Um, so for generations, or for, I think for maybe two generations of Rohingya, all these administrative tactics were placed upon them. This is a particular photograph of a man that was beaten during forced labor in Burma, who then fled in 1992 to southern Bangladesh. You roughly have about 1.2 million Rohingya who live in Burma. Their history goes back hundreds of years. Um, they uh, are a Muslim community within a predominantly Buddhist society. Um, the situation for them has been that since 1962, um, that's been the genesis of most of their problems contemporary-wise. Um, the military dictatorship has, has a historic track record of pinning communities together, this divide and kind of conquer kind of tactic, and they've done that in the Rakhine state where this community lives with the <coughs> Rakhine Buddhist community as well. Um, these invisible tactics take a number of different kind of forms. Um, one would be documentation. So what happens is, is that the Burmese <coughs> authorities hold strict household registers for all Rohingya families living in Rakhine State. Um, every six months, Rohingya families have to have their photographs taken um, to log and register how many men, how many women, how many children um, are in each particular household, and when the authorities come to sync up their records with what they have, what is presently in the house, any discrepancies can then lead to um, jail times, fines, extortion, um, any number of problems that make life miserable for this particular community. That's one particular tactic that the, the authorities have taken that has been invisible to the international community. This is a photograph that was, that, that, uh, that was given to me or loaned to me by a Rohingya of one of those household family registers. What I've tried to do with my work is a couple different things. One is, I've made, my work on the Rohingya has spanned nine years now, and it involves 12 different trips back to southern, eight trips to southern Bang Bangladesh, four trips inside of Burma. Why would that be? Well, it's for a number of reasons, different reasons. One is that the Rohingya situation, I think with a, a, a lot of situations similar to this, which you find around the world, it's, it changes dramatically every single year, and usually never for the better. Um, so what my object, one of my objectives has been is to create this very detailed kind of documentation of what happens to a community over a long period of time. Because I think that's what really rests the heart of the Rohingya situation, is that most people are introduced to the Rohingya in a time when what's happening to them easily fits into the news cycle. Yet at the same time, you have all these events that are taking place in between those news cycles that are really invisible, that rests at the heart of what's happening in this particular community, and I think also rests at the, at the heart to a lot of the, the ways that the State Crime Initiative has laid out their case against genocide against this particular community. I mean, there's obviously this four-tiered kind of approach that the researchers at ISCI took in the way that they structured their research again in terms of genocide for this community. And I think in a lot of ways, the work that I've done fits into that. It was, we work in parallel in a sense, even though we weren't working together for so many years. 
So I've tried to create this documentation, but also try to create things that, that are, it's kind of like evidence in that sense, in terms of building up a general case for the public or for policymakers that this is something that actually has been happening for a long time. Um, and here is the documentation through photo photography that actually can lend to better understanding that. So the next picture will go, will go into this. Text is a really important particular thing for my work, but the other t another tactic that's very common within the within the Rakhine State against the Rohingya has been the restrictions on marriage. The Burmese authorities um, to get married, Rohingya couples need to get formal permission from the local authorities first, um, and that ends up throwing them into this cycle of humiliation and again extortion, bribery, having to pay off loans that are having to pay off authorities through the giving over of land or personal possessions. Um, and really what ends up happening is that most of the times they're denied permission and that forces them to then choose or make a difficult decision. Do I stay here in my home country or do I leave to live some kind of a normal life? And most people choose to leave. One of the leading causes for youth in the Rohingya community to actually leave their homeland is because of the denial of marriage or all the problems that are associated with getting permission to get married. And this is a particular photograph of a young woman who her and her husband were denied the right to get married and they had no choice to leave and so they fled to Bangladesh. There's a whole series of photographs that I've created just on that, touching on that kind of invisible tactic that the government takes. And then you have, obviously, you have kind of human rights abuse that most of the world doesn't know about. I mean, what I try to focus on a lot with my photography is to find situations that add, where stories can, be, can, can contribute together with the photographs. So most of the, most of the images that I'm going to talk about here, they have long stories that go behind them that I either collect audio of with people talking about the stories, or take detailed notes that then l end up lending to written testimonies or something like that that can be added on to the photographs themselves. This is a group of women. Uh, I took their photograph in 2009, and the entire their entire village basically fled Burma over the course of three days. And these three particular women, along with another 13 women, were forced by the authorities into a pond, into a rice, a uh, shrimp pond, where they were forced to stand up to their necks in water for about over 12 hours, look directly up into the sun for hours at a time, had mud thrown at them, and then when they were let, when the authorities let them out, um, the authorities locked up their homes and basically wouldn't allow them. So the whole entire village had really no choice but to flee um, the persecution of the local authorities. And then what you have is you have bond you have for the men in this particular community particularly in Bangladesh um, you have situations of exploitation um, bonded labor slave labor which is very very common for them um, this is an entire community of Rohingya that live in southern Bangladesh who are basically debt bonded laborers to local Bangladeshi boat owners the only way that they can actually survive from one day to the next they're known for being really good very well versed in fishing and so you have this whole community that lives on a beach in southern Bangladesh um, that basically all they do is fish. But to fish, they have to rent equipment or they have to buy equipment. They buy the equipment from the local Bangladeshi boat owners who then, through one way or another, increase the interest on what they own. That ends up throwing them into this cycle of never being able to pay back their debt until they have no choice but to just continue to keep working for the boat owners. Because they're stateless, because they're not recognized as refugees and don't have any legal recourse at all, they basically can't turn to the authorities because the authorities will then extort money off them. So again, they're caught in this cycle. So the photographs try to build up this kind of documentation of you know, invisible abuse and, um, and everything else, uh, both inside Burma and outside of Burma. I'll fast forward a little bit to uh, from the work that I did from 2006 to 2012 until really what rests at the heart of what's happening now and what is really touched on uh, throughout the ISCI report and that is everything that's happened to this community after the violence in 2012. So in 2012 there was violence between the Buddhist community and the Rohingya community that was primarily manufactured by the central government um, that pitted Buddhists 
the Buddhist community versus the Muslim community. The one that actually ended up getting the raw end of the deal in this particular case was the Rohingya. Um, and that was supported mostly by the central government and by local government actors and everything. In the city of Sitwe, which is the capital of the Rakhine state, um, the Rohingya and the Rakhine community coexisted for generations, where there was very little tension between the two. Um, but then what ended up happening is 2012, there was this violence that erupted. And of the 12 Muslim neighborhoods in Sitwe, 11 of them were completely and totally destroyed. And 140,000 people from the community basically amputated from the city of Sitwe. They were forced to flee where they now live in isolated, controlled camps what people would call IDP camps, but what I think ISI and myself and a lot of people who really know the subject, it, they basically now developed into internment slash concentration camps, for, for lack of better words. Um, this is a particular photograph that I took. The violence took place in two waves, in June of 2012 and October of 2012. Um, this is a photograph that I took of the largest Rohingya neighborhood in Sitwe in November of 2012 after the violence. Um, after all the inhabitants, this was filled with buildings, after the violence took place and all the inhabitants of the neighborhood were forced to, to, to flee, basically funneled out into the countryside by the authorities, the, uh, the government came in with bulldozers and bulldozed down everything that was there, including the trees. And now you find there's not even stumps there, because the last time I went back was uh, about a year ago. There aren't even stumps there. Um, so this is a photograph that kind of documents and records that, uh, the significance of this particular photo, if you want to know, the reason why I took this particular photograph, because there really was nothing left that showed a presence of a Muslim community in almost all of Sitwe. The only thing that showed the presence of the Rohingya community in this particular place was this destroyed metal um, bed that is used during um, uh, Muslim burial ceremonies and taking the body from after being prepared out to the graveyard. That's the only thing that was actually left behind. And I think um, I have my own kind of, uh, you know, reasons why I think that was left behind. Um, then you start to get into more of the destruction with, within Sitwe. This is their, uh, almost all the mosques in Sitwe um, were completely destroyed. This is basically just the shell, the facade of one of the oldest mosques in Sitwe that was left behind after the violence. Um, this is in the central market. In the report it talks about how um, part of the, 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 the lead up into genocide is that um, a community is basically um, disempowered in so many different ways. And for the Rohingya community, they, they were hugely successful in, the, in economic, uh, with, the, with the economics in Sitwe. Um, in the central market, there were only two, over 250 stalls and shops that were Rohingya owned. After the violence, all those stores were boarded up, confiscated, and on chalk written on each one of the Muslim owned shops was written by the local authorities, confiscated or already sold, which that's there. Um, so it, it shows, again, this disempowerment of the community and actually the, a, it kind of in this particular photograph, even though it doesn't show the Rohingya, it shows this absence of a community where they actually should belong. The, I mentioned that there were 12 Muslim neighborhoods in Sitwe, 11 of them had been destroyed, only one of them was left. It was, the name of it is called Ong Mingla. Um, it's, it's located right in the central heart of the city of Sitwe. Um, that, so it's basically surrounded by, um, by Buddhist Rakhine neighborhoods. Um, right now, there's roughly, there were about 7,000 people that Rohingya that lived in that neighborhood. Now it's down to about 3,000 because a lot of them have left and gone out to the IDP camps. But those that remain, basically remain and exist now in a modern day ghetto where all the entry points and exit points to on Mingala neighborhood, which falls beyond, are guarded and manned by Burmese police. Rohingya can't come, can't go, supplies are limited in terms of what can come in and what can come out. Um, people can't leave to go to school, go to find jobs. Um, it's really a ghetto today in, in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and that's a photograph that was taken in 2012 um, after the, the, the October violence. 
So then what you have is this extra, this, this next step, I think, that talks about, uh, that was talked about in the State Crime Initiative's report, and that is like this concept of isolation. Um, it's a really important part of the, the, the four processes of the claim to genocide, and, and that's exactly what's happened with the Rohingya community, it partic it particularly in Sitwe, but this falls in place all throughout the Rakhine State, where basically Rohingya now have been rounded up segregated from the local community and have been isolated in, in very controlled situations. This is, um, these are a bunch of Rohingya who have fled the city of Sitwe um, in November. They were temporary live, temporarily living in an old um, uh, mosque and middle school. Um, they were eventually ev evicted from there and now they're living in these IDP camps which are outside the city of Sitwe. The IDP camps or the internment camps, again, entry points are guarded. They can't come and go for a number of different reasons. Um, they can't go to school. They can't get health access to health care. The next series of pictures are edited specifically um, in a way and were taken conscience, consciously for a particular purpose. Um, I've just known situations like this long enough through experience to where when you have a prolonged crisis like this, like the Rohingya, um, it's very easy for the media and the press to jump in and out of a situation with very little context behind what is actually happening right now and the history behind what has brought them to this particular point. Um, this is a photograph, again, right after the initial violence that took place. You have people living in you know, makeshift tents that were actually left over from Cyclone Nargis in 2008, um, living in really, really kind of temporary situations. And for the Rohingya, in, psychologically, the, the physicality of where they're living actually plays into the way that they think, that this is a temporary situation, that their lives as IDPs in these particular camps are temporary and that they will eventually be able to be let to go back home, right? Um, again, temporary existence, a lot of Rohingya who did not get tents were living in this kind of situation. Primitive huts made out of stray, straw, bamboo, you know, whatever they could find, and they lived months on end for this. But psychologically, um, they viewed this as being something that was temporary. This would have been taken in 2013, so we have 2012, 2013. Um, again, 2013, these are more Rohingya who were from a, a completely different st town on the other side of the Rakhine State who fled to where all the um, Rohingya are, are based outside of Sitwe. And now we fast forward up to 2014. This would have been taken in July of 2014. Those, hunt, those huts, those tents that, um, that were originally there no longer exist. What has happened is that the authorities have constructed these barracks um, where they have metal roofs, they have bamboo walls, they have eight families, you have four families that live on one side, four families that live on the other. Each household is, is registered, uh, recorded, um, just like what you see happening when, you, when I take you back to the pictures of people um, and their family registers. Um, so when people come in that haven't seen the history of the temporary tents, the huts, and everything. They automatically walk into this kind of scene where there's the trains provided, and the natural response, I think, for a lot of people, at least people who I've talked to sometimes, have said the conditions are awful, but it's really not that bad because they have a metal roof over their head or they have tents. But they only have this particular frame of reference in terms of how they're viewing the situation. They don't have the previous pictures or the previous history of what's brought the situation to this. What they don't know is that the Rohingya, because of these metal barracks and everything like that, now view psychologically their existence in these camps as not being temporary, but being completely and totally permanent. That there's no way that they will be able to allow, be allowed to go back home because of the situation, the conditions in which they're living in now is more, I guess you could say in some way, humane in a sense, at least a way. Um, but that actually has had a huge psychological impact on the Rohingya community over the past um, year and a half, in the sense that 
now they really feel like the authorities have no plan whatsoever to allow them to go back home. Any questions so far? What's the um, history of the prejudice or the uh, discriminatory practice? The, the history behind it is this, is that you have, you know, the for decades, basically you've had one particular community ruling Burma, that is the Burman community. You have all these conflicts going on on the borders. And what's happened is that in this particular state, the Rakhine mm -hmm. state, um, the, the government has, like I said, manufactured a lot of this um, hatred between the two particular communities. And now I think what you see is that, now what I think you see is that now that there's this process of, of democracy and reform happening mm -hmm. in the country, you have these now these spaces politically that are opening up that are easily exploitable by people. And really, after 40 years, everybody had one common kind of shared enemy in the whole country. It doesn't matter if you were Chin, Mon, Kachin, you know, Rohingya, Rakhine, uh, you know, whatever. You, had, you all shared one common enemy, and that was the central government, the military. But now what you have is you have these spaces opening up politically in the country where people are now grabbing on to whatever political space they can get in the country right now. And that creates, in a lot of ways, that kind of is exploited by the creation of others. And the Rohingya is the perfect example of what's happened in the Rakhine state. The Rakhine community has always had a raw deal by the central government. And they have just a very small sliver of political space that they're trying to grab onto. And in so many ways, the Rohingya community is there threatening that. Um, and at least in Burma, which I think you find in a lot of other places, that right now you have this country that is going through this kind of process of trying to define what its national identity is. Um, and in that process of finding what that national identity is, you now have forces that have a clear idea and agenda of what they want the national idea, uh, identity to be, and they're willing to do anything to try to make sure that their idea, their preconceived notions of what Burmese national identity is after these elections. That's, I think, what you see happening with this huge campaign of anti-Muslim hate speech going on through the Buddhist monks in Mandalay and everything. They have an incredibly powerful voice. Um, so that's what you see happening. Uh, just go through some more pictures within the camps. Again, you know, this, scene, this is the one, this is the photograph that I use most often in kind of articulating that sense of permanency that the community has um, now outside um, in the IDP camps. And then again, more kind of, uh, you know, photographs that are, you know, provide this kind of documentation of, that covers as many different angles and grounds about what's happening um, in the camps. Um, you know, right now, you have the, 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 the Burmese government and the local authorities have basically pushed all of the international NGOs out from providing assistance to the Rohingya. Um, and again, this is another kind of part of what ISCI did in their report, is that you have a community that, not, that is now, you know, um, being deprived of all, these, of all these things. The children in the camps have not, Rohingya children actually have not been able to go to school, any level of school in over two years. Um, and in the camps, because most of the, the, the international NGOs aren't working there anymore, you now have this scramble for health care. They receive just the most basic form of health care. And this is a photograph that was taken um, at a small clinic in one of the IDP camps where you have somebody handing out tickets to see the doctor and there's a scramble for people wanting to get a ticket to see a, a, a doctor for a very quick, basic kind of medical um, assessment or whatever. This is a photograph, again, in one of the IDP camps um, of several hundred Rohingya children who are going to a makeshift school that's run by volunteers from the Rohingya community. So all the children have not been able to go to any kind of formal um, school in over two years, um, and this is all they have. There were seven volunteer teachers working on this particular day, all from the Rohingya community. There's been no government assistance provided um, to uh, to uh, help with the education of students in the IDP camps. Um, 
And that often ends up leading to, you know, basically just survival. I mean, you have children that are not going to school, and so what ends up happening, they end up having to work to provide for their families, which is exactly what's happening in this picture. This is a seven-year-old, his name is Noor. Um, he's working with a, a, with a couple other children and a bunch of Rohingya men who are basically hauling mud from the, the IDP camps are located in an isolated area that basically is just rice paddies. There's nothing out there other than the ocean and rice paddies. Um, and so what they're doing is they're building a man-made dam, lake, so that when the rainy season comes, it will rain, fill up everything with water, where fish and stuff will, will grow, and they can catch the fish and then sell at the local markets within the IDP camps to make some money to other, uh, to other Rohingya. So this, this whole kind of internal economy has started up within the IDP camps themselves just for the Rohingya. Um, and this goes into the whole education thing. Um, in, in, outside of the city of Sitwe is Sitwe University, which is the largest university in the Rakhine state. Prior to the violence, uh, Rohingya and people from the, students from the Rakhine community were both permitted to go to the school. They both, uh, both people, people from students from both communities attended the university. Um, after the 2012 violence, um, no Rohingya have been permitted to go to the school. Um, and actually, the, 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 the story behind this particular photograph is that um, on between, Sitwe University is located between the city, the center of Sitwe and the IDP camps. Um, yet, right before the <coughs> university are three very small Rohingya villages. And every single day, what ends up happening is that um, tuk-tuks, three-wheeled tuk-tuks, um, caravan Rakhine students from the Buddhist community from Central Sitwe out to Sitwe University, where that caravan has to pass those three small Rohingya villages to get to Sitwe University. And when that happens twice a day, they bring them out and they take them home. And on both of those occasions, um, Burmese police close off the entrance ways to those small villages um, so that, and they have armed policemen standing at the gates of Sitwe University to protect the students, but as these Took this caravan of tuk-tuks go speeding by the villages, you have Rohingya students basically who were, could have gone to Sintway University watching their peers from another community go freely to university. Throughout the IDP camps, you now see a huge increased presence of, of Burmese police um, monitoring what's going on, controlling what's happening in, in, inside the IDP camps. Um, and over the past you know, year and a half, You've now seen more um, demonstrations from the Buddhist community um, about their anti-Rohingya sentiment. Um, and these, these next particular pictures um, show this kind of physical manifestation of the hate that actually has been driving a lot of this uh, of the anti-Rohingya um, kind of rhetoric that's been going on in the country, but also it show, shows you know, through my pictures, life guide, like I've described before, most of my photographs over the past nine years have all focused on um, the uh, result of that hatred and those policies. I rarely have the opportunity to actually take images of the um, initiation of that kind of hate, the genesis of that. And this particular protest that took place the end of 2014 in November was a huge anti-Rohingya, anti-UN demonstration that took place in Sitwe by um, the Rakhine community um, with a huge contingent of those being um, monks from the Rakhine community who were all voicing their opinions, um, you know, spreading anti uh, Rohingya hate speech, anti uh, Ban Ki Moon speech. This is the Arakan Women's League, um, a huge contingent of them. Um, and then you had, you know, just a, it was, there was roughly 2,000, I think 2,500 people or so in the protest during that particular day. Um, and they're just, they're visuals that you don't particularly see very often. I mean, usually, you, uh, you know, you. This is, a this is very uh, much against kind of the, the picture that most people have in their head of the Buddhist and the, and the, the monk community in, 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 in uh, Rakhine um, and in Burma. But this is what you see uh, during those protests.
And what's ultimately ended up happening is over the past five years or so, the conditions have gotten so bad in Bangladesh and so bad in Burma that now you have tens of thousands of Rohingya every single year paying smugglers to put them on boats to take them to Malaysia and third countries throughout Southeast Asia. They pay, they pay smugglers to take them to Thailand. Actually, a lot of times they pay very little to get them to Thailand and hoping to get to Malaysia. And once they're, they're there, they're thrown into the hand of traffickers that then end up basically holding them and containing them in, in kind of trafficking in jungle camps where they then end up extorting money off of them and their families to release them to then let them go into Malaysia. Um, this is a series of pictures of, of, of one of those boats just hours before it would leave with about 200 people on it. Um, I think 75 people on that boat were women and children. Um, and over the past year and a half, you've seen, you know, that has actually been something that has been in the news cycle where people have been exposed more to the Rangas, the boat traffic um, throughout Southeast Asia. And the camps found in northern Exactly, yeah. The, the camps found in uh, southern Thailand and northern Malaysia where you found mass graves of Rohingya and, and also Bangladeshis. Uh, and that's a, a picture of a young Rohingya guy in the galley of the boat just hours before we leave. So what I've tried to do with my, with my work is not only as a photographer create work, but also try to find strategic opportunities to collaborate with people where my work can contribute to a much larger conversation. And that's exactly what's happened here in London over the past week. Um, I met everyone at the State Crime Initiative maybe about uh, a little over a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, um, before they started their, their research. And we've kept in touch. And I think both of us have become very familiar with each other's work. And as I do all the time, always seeking collaboratives because um, I, I know that my work as a photographer can only go so far before somebody else needs to go <coughs> to audiences that I can't particularly reach. Um, so for this particular week, I thought it was an extremely successful collaboration in the sense of um, presenting this really in-depth research and this report, but also with marrying visuals to go along with it when people were exposing it to, to have them to, so that we have a much better um, kind of understanding of the context in which the report is trying to, to present its case and show information. Um, and that came from an exhibition launch, then the launch of the report, and then a screening of a documentary. And that's what I try to do. I try to duplicate that on as many occasions as I can every single year. To try to create a program or be a part of a program of events where photography can kind of rest as this kind of centerpiece where everything else kind of orbits around, yet at the same time they all plug into the kind of the same message in some ways. Um, so, that said, I'll open it up for any questions. And you can, you can be questions about my work, about the Rohingya, about other situations of statelessness that I photographed and everything. Um, it's not okay, so I have very limited knowledge in terms of how most photojournalism works, but how do you decide in a narrative? From what you're saying, it sounds like you will kind of search for someone's narrative to fit in with what you're doing, or do you just go in and find what you find and then look for people? Because that's what I'm a little bit unclear. Meaning, meaning look for collaborators? Yes, because you're saying like the media has their narrative, and yes, they obviously do, they yep. tell their coming and tell your story, but you were just saying how you tend to find people to try and fit their yeah. story. So are you choosing what you think people want or are you just going in there finding out everything you can find and then looking because I'm a little bit Okay. Because for... it's basically how can you argue against people who um, criticize your credibility? Sure. So okay. I how can I, can I, basically how I work is that I'll go in and again, I mean this these twenty eight pictures came as a product of twelve different trips. And each particular trip was, there was a whole level of discovery on each particular trip. I know that after each, you know, two week trip or whatever it is that I would make to Bangladesh, that I was just, that trip only lent to peeling off back one layer of the story. And yet it demanded more. Um, fortunately, because I'm based in Bangkok, I have a kind of a luxury to be able to do that because it's so close. So for me, actually, the the, 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 the narrative of my work has really been driven by, by what I've discovered as I'm working in the field. 
Um, that's kind of how, if you look at the way that the the way that I present the work, whether it be in a book form or essay form, there is a narrative behind it. But that narrative, I think, has come simply from discovering what's happening in front of me and listening to the stories of everybody that's that of all the reading that I've met over the years. Now, how does that dovetail in then with finding collaboratives? You know, I mean, I think that that. Let's put it this way. I I've. I find that I'm drawn more to collaborating with organizations that are covering a different kind of element of the larger story that there's just no way I could touch as a photographer, really. And this is just one particular perfect example. Now take for example this, this work here on the Rohingya, it's been shown and exhibited in maybe 15 different international locations over the past two years. Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Tokyo, everything. And in almost all those different places, I've collaborated with different organizations who are playing a role that I would not be able to, to play um, just because I know where my limitations are. Whether it be civil society groups that are working on trying to, to engage um, you know, lawmakers in countries or trying to shape kind of public opinion towards refugees and migrants and actually turning people in those countries to look more internal about how people in Indonesia view refugees or migrants or people who are undocumented. So I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but that's kind of how I've modeled how I, how the main way in the way in which I get my work out throughout the year. I don't know if that was an answer to your question. Uh, yeah, no, it is. Okay. I just um, had a comment and a question. Um, yeah. When you're talking about the move to permanency in the camps, um, I go out to Calais quite a lot, and um, I've seen the same thing, similar things happening there. In that, when I was first going out there, people were staying in, you know, just tents, and they tents and things, and they very much had this idea that they will be gone soon, they'd be on a on a lorry very soon, and this is just very much a temporary situation. And then, as the border has become more like a fortress, and things have got harder, the camp has got bigger people are now sort of making proper shelters and that's doing quite a lot to their psychological well-being. Mm -hmm. I know this might be it, you know, yeah. but, and, you know, as charities are trying to, you know, do their best and make those shelters to, obviously there's been a huge increase in journalists going over there and they're taking photos of this new kind of camp with toilets mm -hmm. with, and that whole thing of like, oh, it's not so bad and they're glossing mm -hmm. over their history of they shouldn't yeah. to be there in the first place. So, I, yeah, I see that happening in Cali. And then this is just a question about um, about Burma. I used to do some work with Burma until 2012. I think I actually saw your exhibition in Documentary Apps in yeah, Asia. Up in China, yeah, yeah, in 2012. But then, so I'm totally out of touch at the moment. So, in Tibet, there's, a, there's lots and lots of claims about Chinese monks sort of infiltrating to get the monasteries being put in there and sort of undermining the religion and playing that kind of role. And I wondered, with the monks that are sort of quite visibly speaking out against the Rohingya, is there any allegation there that they might be have put in place by central government to stir up problems, or is it genuinely the sentiment of most? I, you know, I I I can't really say that I can give you a strict answer on that or not. I know, I do know this much and that, you know, it's very well documented that, um, that people from outside of these, of the Rakhine community, people outside of Sitwe were actually bussed in, and so it was all organized, were bussed in to help contribute muscle to a lot of the violence that took place. I mean, that's been documented and reported. In terms of, you know, the, uh, have, has the central government implanted, you know, people within the, the religious community in Burma to kind of serve their purposes? I wouldn't, I wouldn't even really know. But I can tell you this, is that I felt that when I was there, um, particularly during that particular protest, there were maybe 300 monks of all various ages. I mean, you had monks this tall and you had monks, you know, much older. Um, now, the, the reality of it is, is that, you know, you, you did get the sense that there were a lot of people in that kind of contingent, in the monk contingent, that probably were forced to be there by their monasteries and really particularly maybe didn't have an idea as to 
exactly what was going on, but it's also, the fact is, that a huge number of the people who were in that religious contingency within the, the, the protest, they knew exactly what they were saying and were very, you know, very vocal about it. Um, so I don't, I mean, I wish I could give you a better answer, but I, I don't know, I'm not quite sure. Well, what exactly are they saying, apart from you said the hate message? So are they saying get out of their land or uh... in all yeah, basically. They're saying get out of our land, they're saying they, 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 that they don't recognize, which is ironic, they don't recognize the name that a community named the Rohingya doesn't exist in Rakhine, mm -hmm. yet at the same time they're using the word Rohingya on all of their posters and stuff like this. Um, they're um, you know, basically saying that the UN has in the international community really doesn't have shouldn't have a role in what is happening locally within local politics of Rakhine. Um, because the reason why they were protesting against Ban Ki-moon is that just a few weeks before that demonstration, he actually used the word Rohingya in a speech, and they were protesting his use of the word Rohingya in his speech. Um, so yeah, it's those types of things. And I, the crime mission has, you know, there's all these leaflets that were given out to everybody that whole entire day. Um, and they've got that as evidence as to what was being said and distributed around. Yeah. I think it's really interesting the way uh, you know the sort of narrative is laid out in the situation because a lot of the time you know the Buddhist faith is like regarded as something sort of quite non-aggressive, mm -hmm. and there's all this aggression happening. And when you look at the way that Islamic uh, faith is portrayed in the media, it's very hostile. Yeah. And there's such a sort of juxtaposition here yeah. of the way, you know, um, Muslims are the victims here in this sort of situation. I mean, when you think Islam now, you know, mainstream, like it's like Islamic State, IS, and you know, what have you. But I think, you know, what really interests me is like when um, Nobel winner, um, um, she was awarded the Nobel Prize. Oh, so she, I mean, in, in light of the situation that she came from before she, you know, finally made it to head of state, um, you would think that you know she would have some sort of empathy for these people, or it would give her a different perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, just having been in isolation herself. Yeah. And I just wondered if why you think that you know her appointment as head of state hadn't changed the situation for them. In fact, it made it worse. I would say. Well, I mean, I think you know you, a, a couple, a couple things to a couple kind of things to address what you said. I think one is that you know I, I've tried throughout all the presentations and exhibitions and everything, and even this is that you know I think that it's really the, the the very easy answer to or way of trying to understand what's happening in Rockheim is that this is some religious issue, which it's definitely an element of it but I don't think it is the whole entire story. Um, so that's the reason why in my presentations and in exhibitions, there's a very, just a very small you know, snapshot of that kind of visual because I don't want for that visual to be exploited by people as being the core, the, the reason why all this is happening. Um, I mean, so much of it has to deal with state you know, forces causing this and also I think politics and greed and racism and everything. Um, so that's one thing. I think in terms of Aung San Suu Kyi, you know, I mean everybody has the kind of their their, their answer the as to that. I mean she's not yeah, she's not head of state. She's the op she's the head of the opposition party. Yeah. Which she's not permitted to because of the way the constitution is laid out, she's yeah. not permitted to become president at all. Okay. But her party is still there to contest and to fight against the central government. I mean, I think a lot of people would argue the legitimacy of the upcoming elections, but the fact is, is that she has, because of her iconic position that has been all been constructed on the rule of law, of you know, freedom of fear, of you know, human rights, and everything, she, has, she holds this position in the country to be able to talk against something like this is happening, yet she has chosen not to. Um, I think anybody could come up with a number of different reasons why that would be, and everybody, so many of those reasons probably in one element or another would be right, but the fact is, is that, you know, she's not a human rights activist anymore, she's a politician, mm -hmm. and she has to think about what's going to happen for her party in the elections. 
and one of the things, probably the most sensitive issue that anybody can talk about in the country right now that will lose you votes is anybody supporting the Rohingya community and what's going on there. Um, and I think that's, you know, she's made a very, I mean, in one way, she's made a very calculated decision to not speak up in support of this particular community, which I think, uh, at least when you hear a lot of people in the human rights world talk, that it's been a huge disappointment. Um, mm. uh, because, now whether she, whether her voice could actually change the course of what's happening with this community, or if it could have over the past two or three years, I mean, that's all kind of speculation. Mm. Um, but really, the Rohingya community has no supporters in the country whatsoever right now. Um, and, and, and this kind of violence and discrimination, it, it now goes beyond the Rohingya community into more of the other Muslim communities around the country as well. I mean, there are, there's a Kaman community which actually are considered citizens. They're one of the 135 recognized national races of Burma that have citizenship. Yet, over the past two years, they've faced a lot of persecution. Same thing happens with Muslim communities living up in Mandalay, Mactila, and everything. I mean, but it's happened. It's, it's but it's that is, but that, I think, has been fueled by the radical agendas of some of these more extremist Buddhist communities in the country as well. I see. So, even though it is about religious discrimination, at the same time, the aggression is anti their faith, which is quite ironic. Yeah, and I think in a lot of ways, the way that it has been the way that it has been framed within Burma is that it is the protection, the preservation of Buddhist identity in Myanmar, yeah. and anything that will threaten that Buddhist identity is, which has been which Islam and which Muslim communities, that has been, they have been made the one for people to fear in the country. But again, that has been mostly fueled by these very strong, powerful, vocal extremist forces within the monkhood um, yeah. in, in, in the country. Could I, sorry, I have to go back to my classroom. But um, you kind of lost sight of uh, what I thought you were going to present because you've become like, Instead of you, you, you become like talking like a sociologist through a story. Okay. The, the, the theme, what I thought you were going to ask, was about the use of still imagery. And uh, can I ask you, uh, what do you think the normativity of your images are? Well, what do you mean by that? I mean, well, you know, what, why do you pick certain images? You, you, you said you know, uh, this uh, elderly man from Bangladesh. Now, what do you want the image to achieve in terms of grip, of, uh, of um, audience, of uh, connectivity, and how? I think, you know, the, okay, let's put it this way. I find that, at least the way that I work, I work very rarely on just a single image. Mm -hmm. Most of my work and the way that it's always been presented has been presented in like a story form, an essay kind right. of form, yeah. mm -hmm. where you have the collective trying to mm -hmm. establish um, the, a message for the larger story, not just one particular photograph. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of it goes into you know how I edit the stories mm -hmm. um, and everything. I think that because I've come to the Rohingya story through kind of the prism of statelessness mm. and this denial of citizenship, because really that's what rests at the heart of you know, all the work I've done over the past 10 years, is the issue of statelessness, the denial of citizenship. How does the denial of citizenship end up then flowing down to impacting mm. people in their day-to-day -day lives? And that could be a number of different things, for at least for the Rohingya community, and it's different for every single stateless community, and I'm draw, I I'll apologize because I think that my natural mm -hmm. tendency is to draw it back towards more of this kind of sociological kind of mm -hmm. framework, but the fact is, is that with all different, with all stateless communities, their histories are different, and the way that the denial of citizenship impacts them in their daily lives changes from one community mm -hmm. to the next, regardless of where they are. For the Rohingya community, what I've tried to do, and the reason why I've chosen the pictures mm -hmm in the edit that I have, is to basically show how a community like the Rohingya can be rendered almost totally empowerless, powerless without having the right 
to the connection of citizenship and whatever rights that citizenship might afford them. And I think, again, this is the reason why this, this, the project has, I've been going so many years on the project, is because in so many ways it, it touches us to challenge, you know, what are the different definitions we have today in 2015 of what is citizenship based mm -hmm. on the context of <clears throat> where citizens are in different places. Citizenship might mean a different thing to somebody in Burma, whereas it means a different thing to somebody here in Europe or in Africa or the Dominican Republic. So at least with this particular story, that's the thing that I've tried to do and that's the reason why I've chosen the photographs um, and the narrative that I have with that. I don't know if that answers mm -hmm. your question, but... Mm -hmm. How long are you in London or are you... Are you I'm here for another two weeks. Yeah, so I'm around. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank I'm going to go back to class watching a movie while I'm out of class. Okay, so, yeah. Good. Good. I should have just brought them across, but there was 40 of them, or 30 of them, so I might have been a bit much. Okay. <laughs> Thanks again. So, Cheers, man. Okay, thank you so much, Greg, for the insightful presentation. We do have copies of the ISKI report in the back, which found compelling evidence of genocide in Myanmar. Uh, you're welcome to take a look, uh, and please hang around. We do have some food. Uh, and Greg will be around uh, for questions.